one-fifth of the investments that have gone into Chinese artificial intelligence in the last six years have come from the United States. And it's just not capital transfers. It's the transfer of valuable know-how. So we are seeing time and again in every sector in China how American companies have aided China's economic rise, technological rise. In fact, the Wall Street remains China's biggest ally. So cutting that links, cutting those links, slowing the transfer of key technologies to China has to be part of the strategy. And the Biden administration finally seems to be waking up to that realization. Chinese are not infallible. I mean, there is a myth that has been built up, you know, that the Chinese, are, the rise is inexorable, etc. We are seeing it now uh, stumble. Uh, the second thing is that the Chinese are obsessed with their security. The fact that the Chinese Communist Party has to survive, that is their obsession. And that is also a weakness. When we were speaking of ignition, may I please ask for silence? Actually, your, your conversation and your chatter is a great way for me to actually thank one of our partners, Shivas Glassware, whose content is adding to our animation. So thank you, Shivas. Uh, and Shiv Nader Foundation, as I already said, some of you may have joined late, so I just want to do a quick round of thanks. Shiv Nader is a fantastic uh, uh, you know, foundation that really believes in creative entrepreneurship, and so it's particularly good to partner with them. You know, as many of you know, they have wonderful schools and colleges, but they also support the arts, habitats, you know, environmentalists, and then people like us who passionately believe in the power of conversation. So thank you, Shiv Nader. Kaveri Hospital, preeminent, uh, you know, medical care in, in Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, but who add that element of compassion. And page three, as I said, who was our grooming partner, uh, helped Ekta and me look our natural selves today, so thank you. And I just want to give a shout out, I haven't met him, but I don't know if Ramji Narasimhan is here, but he was very much someone who helped me in my ignition when I parted ways with our old company, he said, anything you're starting, I'm going to back it. And he put in some money that helped me get started. So thank you, Ramji, if you're here. And a big thank you to my partners at Lucid Lines, Aditya Puri, Walmik Kabir, Dibyangi, and uh, Brand Avatar team, Hema Chandra, Ravi, Preksha, and Hemu, of course, who's our co-host. So thank you, all of you. And it may sound a cliche, it may sound like I'm doing the IFA Awards, but I really do mean it. Thank you, Chennai, for being here like this. It's amazing to have an audience. You know, even speakers get excited to have an audience like you. So thank you. And now to the session that, you know, I've been really interested to bring together over here with two preeminent thinkers and strategic thinkers. And like I said earlier, it's the, not the elephant in the room, it's the big dragon in the room. And we need to talk about it. China in 2049 will turn 100. And recently when Xi Jinping took over power, you know, unlimitedly for the third term, like Mao, Mao Zedong, he said that they're working towards making China great again, you know, in, in the kind of Chinese exceptionalism. And he said it provides an alternative vision for humanity based on scientific socialism and Chinese wisdom. And here's my additional statistic that they spend more than 200 billion on managing internal discontent and suppressing dissent. They call it internal uh, security. And that's 7% more than their defense budget. So when they say that it's an alternative vision for humanity, we all better sit up and take notice. It's very interesting that in 2047, India will also turn 100. We are countries on different trajectories. We too are on a pathway of saying this is the Indian century, we are going to be great. 
I personally think we've always been great, but you know, we have a new resolve to be acknowledged as great. So that's one collision coming up. And then we have the third angle of the triangle, which is America, which has always thought it was great. And now there's this big, uh, you know, triangular tussle going on, a lot of it focused in Asia. And like our session said, Asia's on fire on many counts, certainly on a 4,000 kilometer live LAC. Taiwan, the South China Sea, the entire Indo-Pacific region is bubbling over with a kind of lava that's heating up. So we really need to talk about it, analyze it, and perhaps there's not enough of it that happens in our, uh, you know, in our media conversations, so it's really good to have this. I'm just going to leave us with two or three statistics before we get into the session, which is that it came as a shock to me that India, and this is Mr. Chalani's statistic, that India in the last year has a trade deficit with China, which is more than 100 billion. That's more than our defense budget, and uh, you know we contribute 11% to China's trade surplus. Uh, the European Union is China's greatest trade partner, not America. Saudi Arabia is its greatest trade partner. We've, as I said, contribute to it. Africa is its greatest trade partner. In fact, at a time when we're all saying less of China, two-thirds of the world trade more with China than with America. And today, it compares with the IMF and the World Bank as an equivalent, if not greater, lender to other countries. So China has this of how to fight and to win, uh, how to win without fighting. And that's what we want to analyze. What is the scale of that threat? What are we doing to combat it? Are we doing enough? To read the Chinese tea leaves, as I said, we have two fantastic speakers today, Brahma Chalani. All of you read his columns, his books. He's one of the most eminent geostrategic uh, thinkers in India. He's also at the Center for Policy Research. He has several books on China. We have Jayadev Ranade. I didn't check with you whether I'm allowed to say this, but I think we sent it out on the WhatsApp. He's been part of the unnameable, which is the RAW. It's usually called the Cabinet Secretariat, but he's served in China, in Hong Kong. Uh, he knows Mandarin, and he's really understands China from deep within, continues to be a watcher, is part of the think tank, often advises government against the grain. So it's wonderful to have both of them here. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Brahma Chalani and Jayadev Ranade. I wanted to start with you, you know, that uh, it's very interesting, I reeled out some of your statistics, so I'm sorry if I stole some of your fire, but, you know, when we talk about China, and we'll come to the LAC and the military expansionism, but what is a real surprise is this trade war, you know, it's, it's financial power over the rest of the world, and you've been writing quite prolifically about that. Can you first spell out, uh, you know, the scale of this um, financial threat of China, and you know, they believe in fight, uh, winning without fighting. How do we combat that? Are, is India doing enough to combat that? Or are we contributing to their uh, dominance over us? Win without fighting is the motto of the Chinese strategy. They have changed the entire geopolitical map of the South China Sea without firing a single shot. They have re-engineered the flows of international rivers like the Mekong without firing a shot. They encroached on large tracts of Indian territory in Ladakh without firing a single shot. They took us by complete surprise. So their strategy has always been to avoid direct combat, to achieve their objectives below the threshold of armed conflict. They are just the opposite of Russia. You know, can, all Russia of you, can all of you hear him at the back? The Russians tend to have this massive, full-fledged invasion. They did that in Crimea, 
in 2014 and, and then more recently in Ukraine a year ago in February last year, full-fledged aggression. That's not the Chinese approach. The Chinese have learned from their disastrous invasion of Vietnam in 1979 to achieve their objectives, strategic, geopolitical, and economic, without engaging in combat. So they have done enormous expansionism that we have seen in Asia and beyond, even in the South Pacific, without firing a single shot. So the question I want to ask you there is, you know, you, you've kind of laid that out, just how big this uh, operation and ambition of theirs is. But I used, and I said I stole your fire by giving away that one statistic that India over the last year has, you know, our trade surplus with China has gone up by 50% to 100 billion, and we contribute 11% to their trade surplus, which is to the tune of 800 billion and more. So why, at a time when our LAC is live, we are posturing that we are taking on China, America's worried, are we really that dependent? Is this essential goods that we can't decouple from China? Uh, you know, help us understand our strategy on this. <clears throat> well, you have asked a question that all of us should be asking, and I'm surprised that we don't have this question debated in the country. Why is it that since the Chinese aggression began in April 2020 when they caught us napping by encroaching on certain key Ladakh borderlands, we have seen the Chinese trade surplus with India rise dramatically. In other words, we have allowed China to reap rewards of aggression. How do we allow that? I can understand that, you know, we cannot cut essential imports from China. We depend on them, for example, for pharmaceutical ingredients to manufacture pharmaceuticals. We can't cut off supplies from China. We can't, have, we can't cut off supplies of chips from China. These are all critical to our manufacturing. But non-essential imports. Why are we allowing our markets to be flooded with cheap, substandard goods? Why have we allowed our small and medium-scale manufacturing to get killed? Why are we doing that? Why are we harming our economic interests and rewarding China? I have been raising this question for a long time. I don't get an answer from anybody. That's, you know, that, that kind of leaves me gobsmacked because I was hoping we were going to get an answer from well, you. The, <laughs> the, the truth is that the import lobbies in India are major financiers of political parties. You don't say that openly, but that's the truth. That import lobbies in India are very strong. They have a lot of financial muscle. They finance all major political parties. And that's also one reason why, unlike the other Asian economies, India is not an export-driven economy. India is an import-dependent de economy. Import-dependent dependent economy that actually relies on domestic consumption for economic growth. The only other major economy in the world that is like India is the United States, which, like India, relies on domestic consumption for growth. But we have not sought to, for example, to build the manufacturing base to become a manufacturing powerhouse, how do we give employment to all these teeming millions of youths in India? They can't be absorbed in agriculture. They can only be absorbed in manufacturing. And manufacturing means you have to allow small and medium scale manufacturing to flourish, not to die. And, and that requires India to pursue a long term economic policy which seeks to aid manufacturing, which seeks to take advantage of the fact that India has comparatively lo lower labor costs, and the fact that today, Western companies are seeking to slowly shift production out of China. So this is India's moment of opportunity, and the demographics so, are on India's <clears throat> side. So I'll just come back to you. You know, I just want to uh, bring in Mr. Ranade. You know, as I said that your CV is very exciting, if there are a few people who can understand what the Chinese mind thinks, 
it would be you. So, you know, I just want to lay out the threat before we can begin to see what is it that India should be doing. So we, we spoke of this trade and financial strength and we know about the Belt and Road Initiative, the way it's, you know, been lending to Sri Lanka and Pakistan and all of that. So if you move away from that a little bit and look at the other pillars of threat, you know, the military, the, the cyber security, the technological, you, you've written a book on water, help us understand where is China placed militarily and technologically versus America and us? Uh, well, as far as we are concerned, uh, China represents a multi-dimensional threat. It's not just uh, military, that's one part, a major part, but it's cyber, it's uh, cultural, it's uh, getting into our innards, if I may say, uh, science and technology and environment. So these are uh, uh, the range of threats that we have. But as you said, on the military part, our entire 4,057-kilometre LAC is today live. And uh, they have retained for themselves the option of where they are going to do what. But uh, here I would uh, say um, that I think now we have reached a point where they are not going to be able to push any further in terms of ingress. And uh, there is uh, thinking going on that uh, we need to retaliate. How to do it without pushing the, uh, you know, pushing things over the edge is what we are looking at. The second thing is, China itself seems to be preparing, not for a hot war or a hot conflict, but uh, just uh, three weeks ago, uh, we saw some tender notices where they have uh, asked companies, their own companies of course, to manufacture clubs with barbed wire and stuff and given, you know, specifications. So obviously they're getting ready for uh, Galwan type clashes rather than um, uh, shooting war. But that's something obviously uh, we will take care of. And I think uh, we, are, we are at a point today where things can go either way. The second is on cyber. I think here we are underprepared. Uh, America is going to have a tough time because the person who is going to launch a cyber attack, he retains the element of surprise. Uh, there is also no way in which you can prove 100% as to where the cyber attack originated. So Chinese have that little uh, thing. But just to give you an idea of the scale, they've got 80,000 people who are working on cyber attacks on India and the Dalai Lama setup across the world. So what they're doing is they're surveilling our computer, uh, computers in government offices in scientific institutes, etc., and then deciding where to attack. Uh, you so would, have would, would you say that the Bombay, you know, when the lights, Mumbai, when the lights failed? Oh, or certainly. The, Not only that, the, the recent attack on the hospitals. Um, you know, a number of our uh, politicians go to hospitals and uh, getting their, uh, the details, the health details is important for them. Uh, that's one part. The second is they could also cripple the hospitals functioning by destroying all the data, by uh, disrupting the networks. They've also incidentally uh, stopped trains. So, you know, th there is a, uh, a lot of damage that they can do. Apart from the fact, um, uh, Brahma came close to it, he didn't touch on it. But uh, when he was talking about the power or the muscle of Indian industry or the so-called uh, industry, uh, he didn't talk about Huawei and ZTE. You, you and said so-called industry. That's making me smile. <laughs> you know. Well, I mean, uh, industry. Are you, are you referring to recent developments? No, not only that, but industry be believes a lot in investment for the future uh, and uh, looking ahead. You know, I don't know how many of our companies really do it, even the big ones. So I, just before you open up new doors, I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, pin you down on a couple of things. One, you said that we should. Uh, push back, you know, and that there are ways to make them stop ingressing. Again, by media reports, we've lost 26 patrolling points out of 65 that we had. There's been a huge occupation of Indian land, though we are not exactly saying that in public life. Uh, but you would know that, you know, but when you're saying that India can push back, what form can that take? Are you suggesting conventional attack or, you know, what is the form of pushback that India can do? I think there are two things that we can do straight away. Firstly, I think that the policy that we've followed so far has been uh, uh, good. Uh, we have uh, not 
uh, sort of uh, escalated the situation beyond a point. But uh, we have made it very clear that the, uh, that the relationship will not be normal. Uh, that's one. But I don't think that's enough. Uh, I think the second, before the Chinese do something else, and they've done now, there are two In major Taiwan, incidents yeah. that have happened. Um, the things are going to happen uh, this year, I, I anticipate. Uh, we will probably, or what we are, uh, should be doing, is if they come in at a certain point, we can hit elsewhere where uh, they're vulnerable. There are points like that. I think our uh, army has already worked out where they are, and I think uh, that is the kind of response that we need to do. It will still be below the threshold of war. The second thing, which I, again, I feel is uh, crucial, and which we haven't done, is you were talking about trade. It has jumped from 70 billion in 2020 April to slightly over 100 billion now. That's after the uh, April in attack, incursion yeah. uh, that happened. Um, the bulk of this trade are small goods, like, you know, idols, lampshades, bulbs, etc. Toys. Yeah. Uh, I don't see why we can't impose some prohibitive uh, duties on their imports or ban them altogether, because these are small traders who go there, do the purchases in bulk and come back. Uh, by doing this, by uh, putting these ban, you will be tackling your unemployment problem also because all the small scale industries that have closed down, which employed four, five people, ten people, uh, they will be revived. So I think that's something that we should do. I don't know why we're not doing it, uh, though I, uh, there is a momentum that is building up asking people to stop that. Right. So just, you know, before I come back to Brahma, that I want to ask you, because you've been part of the intelligence network, that would you accept that it's been a huge intelligence failure, that there can be incursions like this? And for lay people like us, it's hard to understand in, a, in an era when you have satellites and you have the Chinese balloon floating over America, uh, you know, with all that we say we possess, how can uh, an incursion happen without our knowledge? In this day and age, how can any incursion happen without another country's knowledge? I'm not being facetious now when I say that it's a very convenient uh, stick, you know, to beat the intelligence setup with. There are three, four factors here which you've got to remember. One is that even if you do collect the intelligence and you know what's happening, and as you said, with satellites in the sky and other things and electronic eavesdropping, it's not uh, something that is, um, you know, that is not going to happen. I mean, you are going to know. Uh, but a lot depends on people who receive it, how they analyze it, and how they decide to respond. So I'll leave it at that, but let me just say that I doubt if all the satellites failed, if all the electronic eavesdropping devices failed, so I leave it at that now. Okay, you know, I mean, again, we can only, we, we have an appetite for spicy stories, so tell me, is it really difficult to gather intelligence on China? Is there language difficulty, there are restrictions of travel, when you were there in whatever avatar you were in, can you help us understand, is it more difficult to gather intelligence on China than, say, Pakistan? What are the difficulties that you face, and are we good at it? It's very difficult. Uh, there are two things. One is the Chinese system and uh, the Chinese nature. They're a homogeneous uh, society, by and large, at least the Han Chinese. The second is the state controls. They do not allow the Chinese citizen to interact with foreigners. So even if you want, happen to befriend a Chinese with great difficulty, to meet him is an exercise in itself. It takes an hour and a half to two hours of going around the city and then trying to meet him. Uh, it's very tough. Uh, you're under watch, your house is uh, bugged, all the houses of diplomats are under watch. Um, you are under watch when you go out. So it's very tough, but it's not that it can't be done, and it's not that it's not being done, but it is very tough much easier to operate in other countries like Bangladesh or, you know, wherever. So on a scale of 10, where would you put our intelligence apparatus on China? That's a difficult question. I've been out of the game now for a little while. <laughs> and, and you've become a safe artist in the meantime. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to let you off on that. Uh, you know, I want to come back to some of the things that we don't discuss, which, you know, we were chatting over dinner yesterday, and you were saying the Dalai Lama, the water issue, these are perhaps even more dangerous than what we do discuss, which is conventional war and stuff. So I'm going to come back to that. Brahma, I wanted to bring you in that, you know, Michael Pillsbury, who was the advisor for uh, President Trump, he wrote a book called The 100-Year Marathon, 
where he said that America had pretty much underwritten the rise of China, you know, and that they'd been duped into uh, enabling China on technology, education, trade, everything. So, you know, now again, when there's a talk of decoupling, is America doing enough? I'm going to come to what India should do, but is in terms of ge geostrategic partnerships, in terms of decoupling, is America doing enough to take on China and where does India play uh, in their scheme of uh, things? To provide some historical context, China's rise owes a lot to the United States. It's from Richard Nixon to Barack Obama, successive US presidents aided China's economic rise. It was President Trump who made a paradigm shift in American policy by treating China as a competitor and as an adversary. Then comes Joe Biden. Now, Joe Biden has not reversed Trump's China policy, but without reversing that policy, Biden has sought to pursue a more conciliatory approach toward China. Now, unfortunately for him, China's actions every now and then, the latest spy balloon being the latest example, that China acts recklessly and inflames passions in America. The latest spy balloon incident is being portrayed by the critics of Joe Biden as a clear sign of his weakness. The fact is that a balloon traverses across the United States and that's an action on the part of the Xi Jinping regime that is counterproductive to American, to, to Chinese interests because it, it awakens Americans to the big threat that America faces. The big threat that America faces is not a declining Russia, right? A declining Russia does not pose the prime threat to the United States. Yet the Biden administration is focused on containing Russia, on weakening Russia, as they, as they put it, by entrapping Russia in a military quagmire in Ukraine. And that strategy is leading to depletion of American weapons arsenals at a time when the prime threat from China is rising. So many in, the, in, the, in Washington now are beginning to, but you didn't hear this a few months ago or even two months ago, only now uh, from, from, from this year, you're hearing voices telling the Biden administration that its strategy of prolonging the Ukraine war by supplying increasingly sophisticated and longer range weapon systems to Ukraine is actually inimical to America's own long-term interests because America's prime, prime threat comes from China. And the spy balloon incident clearly demonstrates to the Americans, to the general American public, that China is the threat. You know, so uh, we've kind of established the scale. We could go on all night about establishing other ways that China is threatening us. I just wanted to share a little detail with you. Uh, there's Nicholas Chalin, who was the chief software officer of the Pentagon, who, retired, uh, who resigned two years ago, saying that uh, in, this, in the technological AI war between America and China, that America's lost the war. He said it's a done deal in the next 15, 20 years. America cannot take on China, and I'm not going to watch that process, you know, because America is so behind. And that's someone from within the Pentagon saying it. So, like, we could keep establishing how dangerous China has become in Taiwan, elsewhere. The, the line I'm pursuing now is that what is it that countries can do, you know? So, what is it that America should be doing? And you've established it's not doing enough, but what is it that it should be doing? Well, artificial intelligence. How has China come up as a leader in artificial intelligence? One fifth of the investments that have gone into Chinese artificial intelligence in the last six years have come from the United States. And it's just not capital transfers, it's the transfer of valuable know-how. So we are seeing time and again in every sector in China how American companies have aided China's economic rise, technological rise. In fact, the Wall Street remains China's biggest ally. So cutting that links, cutting those links, slowing the transfer of 
key technologies to China has to be part of the strategy. And the Biden administration finally seems to be waking up to that realization because recently we have seen the Biden administration impose restrictions on the transfer of advanced chips to China. And according to American media reports, it's also working on prohibiting transfer of sensitive technologies to key sectors in China. That announcement or the declaration or policy guidance hasn't come, but it's supposed to be coming in the coming weeks or months. That indicates that the US is finally seeking to do what it should have been doing years ago, but it, it compounds the challenges for countries like India because India is not transferring valuable know-how to China. The, the US is doing it, and, and therefore, for India's own security, the US has to do what's in American interest. Uh, and, and what's in American interest is also in India's interest right. in terms of <clears throat> dealing with China. So and and pushing, pushing Russia toward China, as, as US policy is doing through the Ukraine war, is again counterproductive to Indian interests. Because if you, if you force Moscow to pivot to Beijing, you are compounding India's security dilemmas. So India needs American help in order, in order to address India's own security dilemmas. So I'm going to you know, just leave a question for you before, uh, which is that, so we have a lot of our military equipment coming from Russia. Russia now has an unlimited, they've said it's a partnership without limits with China. Both of them have interests in Pakistan. So actually, we are really dependent on a country that is very close to two of our greatest adversaries. Uh, and so, you know, I wanted to understand what India is doing about, you know, maneuvering out of this kind of geostrategic bind that it's in. And I'm going to come back to you on that. But I wanted to pull you in, uh, you know, on these two very interesting aspects that you threw, which is the threat of water and the Dalai Lama becoming a flashpoint and how should India handle that, you know? China's sitting on all our water fountains, both in Tibet and in the West and through the Brahmaputra in the East, the entire Gangetic Plain. We're extremely vulnerable to China. Uh, what is your reading on that? You know, is India aware and what are we doing about it? What should we do about it? I think we were slow in reacting. <clears throat> in the sense, we had the information as to what they were planning to do. We had it uh, since about 19, uh, late 1980s. And um, uh, they had uh, unveiled the plans of what they're going to do, how they're going to go about it. What was not clear was specific um, uh, engineering technology that they're going to use to divert the Brahmaputra and move it to the north. Um, but they have now come out, uh, said that they are going to do it, whether it's through uh, what they call a minor nuclear explosion in the Great Bend, or whether three, it is through a series of dams is yet to be seen. But they're building about a total of 17 dams, so-called run of the river uh, dams, but each run of the river dam is going to reduce the water flow. So uh, where is the Brahmaputra going to be is the big question. It's going to affect us. It's going to affect Bangladesh too. Uh, the other thing is the immense amount of infrastructure work that is going on in Tibet. Uh, you probably know that each airfield, uh, the area around the airfield registers, I mean a functional airfield, registers a one degree rise in temperature. Now they've got eight airfields functioning in Tibet. They are building more roadways, expressways rather. They've uh, uh, they have, uh, set up two railway lines uh, to transport troops. Apart from that, they're bringing in a lot of Hans in there as labor. Now the temperatures in Tibet are going to rise. Chinese scientists or climatologists have said that uh, there is a three degree rise in temperature that they anticipate by the end of next year. In which case, the glaciers will retreat. The main tributaries that come and feed the Ganges and the Indus are going to be affected. So for us, it is a major problem. And the indo gangetic belt, which is where these rivers come, is where the bulk of the Indian population is. Uh, we face a problem not only there, but if water is reduced, supply of water is reduced to Bangladesh, then we will see a flood of people coming from there. 
If that happens in Pakistan, we'll have again a problem uh, with people coming in here. So we've got very serious problems uh, on so, water. You know, you, you, what is your solution? I'm, you know, we're going to run out of time and there's so much more to discuss, but what, what is your solution? You were saying that India should inter internationalize our water problems with China. D does the government, you know, previous governments, this government, the security establishment, are they with you on that? Is it a dangerous game to play? Because then you might internationalize Kashmir as well. So what is it that India should do? I mean, geographically, we are so vulnerable to China. I don't think we should, firstly, I don't think we should have a defensive mindset. The second thing is, uh, how does Kashmir get linked with it? Uh, I would have understood if you'd said Faraka, but Faraka is already an issue between Bangladesh and us. I think we must raise the uh, Brahmaputra issue internationally at every forum. With that, we must also, uh, you know, point out or um, uh, out China uh, for human rights, etc. After all, uh, today we are in a situation where they've actually come into our territory, where we are asking them to restore the status quo as on April 2020. So that is very clear. So I don't think we need to be defensive. And uh, there are going to be other problems coming up. You alluded to the Dalai Lama. That's a serious issue too. Which can is you, can you just say up. that in a nutshell? Because I'm always greedy to put in as many uh, thought uh, you know, well, seeds as, as possible. As and when the Dalai Lama, this Dalai Lama passes from the scene, that's the 14th Dalai Lama, there'll be, as he has said, either a reincarnation or an emanation. The emanation is when he picks an uh, elder, elder person and says that that is my emanation and that cuts out the period of high vulnerability when the child is growing. Reincarnation will be a problem. But if, let us say, hypothetically, that he is reincarnated in Tawang, then the Chinese are going to go ballistic. Uh, they are going to make all kinds of demands on us. And I think, by and large, there are uh, positions should be very clear. What the Tibetans want is what we should do. Uh, we don't believe in interfering in religion. So the Tibetans will obviously go with whoever the Dalai Lama has uh, decided, and that's the Dalai Lama we should decide. Right. So there is going to be a problem there. So, you know, I'm just going to pose two more questions before I take up the, because we are running out of time. One is that, you know, we have now positioned China as this fire-breathing dragon, but you have a very interesting perspective where you say that there are a lot of troubles within China that actually could be its own downfall. And I'd like you to literally bullet shot that out because we are running out of time. While you're just thinking that through, I want to bring you in, Brahma, on the strategic question I asked you, that, uh, you know, in the way Asia is reorganizing itself, is India making the correct alliances? Which are the interesting ones that you think we are doing? And what are the ones we should do? Well, first, uh, alliances provide value only up to an extent. At the end of the day, you have to be capable of defending peace. If you just talk so, to me, I'm going to quickly look at the um, questions. Th that is the key to India's security, India's own capabilities. The interesting thing about India is that India can send a spacecraft to the Mars. India is a space power, a missile power. Where India cannot import, India has excelled in those areas. But in conventional arms, from guns to name anything, we are highly import dependent. Why? Why are we import dependent? The answer is very simple, corruption. Where imports are possible, we have allowed our capabilities to remain weak. Where no country will sell you anything, India excels. How can a country become a global power? with this kind of mindset, with this kind of, of um, approach, where we are not able to manufacture basic armaments. Of course, we are, we are seeing efforts now to correct that. We are seeing this focus on domestic defense equipment manufacturing. And I'm glad that some corrective steps are being taken. But it's very important, as Mao said, and Mao you know, Mao committed the worst genocide in history, you know, bigger than, than Holocaust under Hitler. The great um, 
the Great Leap Forward was a man-made disaster that killed, by conservative estimates, 45 million Chinese. But he said one thing that we should always keep in mind, that the first test that any country has to pass on the way to becoming a major power is to be able to defend itself with its own capabilities. That's the test India must pass in order to become a global power. Right. You know, there are just so many aspects, and I'm going to actually ask you all if you want five more minutes of this session or we should bring in a draft halt. Those of you who want some more, can you raise your hands? Oh, okay, that's quite a majority. So I'm going to risk taking five minutes more and do stay for Karan's session because he's fantastic. Uh, so, Jaydev, I asked you that question that what is the implosion within China? And there are a lot of people asking that here as well, that their illiberalism, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to like, Many people are asking that, is there scope that there could be a dethroning of Xi within China, revolt within China? What are the challenges it's facing within? Firstly, I'd just like to say, <clears throat> without answering your question directly, but uh, I'll come to that, is that the Chinese are not infallible. I mean, there is a myth that has been built up, you know, that the Chinese are, the rise is inexorable, etc. We are seeing it now uh, stumble. Uh, the second thing is that the Chinese are obsessed with their security. The fact that the Chinese Communist Party has to survive, that is their obsession. And that is also a weakness. Uh, during Tiananmen, I was there incidentally, and uh, particularly at the Knights, uh, the leadership was in chaos. They were uh, frightened, they were worried, and uh, later on, of course, they accused Chao uh, Tseyang, et cetera, of being a counter-revolutionary rebellion. But they uh, uh, were obsessed with security. Now when you see, since 2015, the security budget going up, and today it's about $70 billion more than their national defense budget, um, it indicates the worry that they have. The worry which we are seeing today because of the slowdown in the economy. It's about 3%, 2.9 correctly, uh, instead of having been 5.5 which they wanted. There is massive unemployment. Graduate, graduate unemployment is at 32%. People are not getting jobs. I mean, I can go on and on. But uh, while Xi Jinping has strengthened his position, he's put his loyalists in place, but he realizes that if people get together, if there is a rash of protests, it will be difficult to control. And that is, the re that is what they are worried about, but that is also their weakness. Because at the same time, they haven't been able to settle the ethnic minorities, either Mongolia or Xinjiang or Tibet, which makes up more than half of China, just in land area. And uh, he is still uh, barreling hard on uh, the ethnic minorities. He reduced their representation by 10%. The third and final point is, uh, I think that in itself is a weakness of theirs. This story that they built up, that they're invincible, that they're going to take over uh, the Asia Pacific region, et cetera. Well, we blocked them at Doklam. We blocked them now. And I think if we do retaliate or take some offensive action, I'm not talking about a big action, it'll puncture the balloon. Much as what Vietnam did in 1979. And it'll take them a long time to recover. Uh, it'll certainly put Xi Jinping in the spot. So I think, uh, you know, it's not game over. Uh, there is still a lot that can happen, and uh, let's see. After all, Xi Jinping made a mistake at the last party congress when he threw a challenge to the Americans, and we saw what Trump did. Uh, you know, I'm going to call out a few questions, and then you, both of you just pick one each that, or two each that you would like to do. Uh, in that, you know, I, you didn't mention the demo, demographic uh, slowdown in China, and I thought it'd be interesting for us because we are always bemoaning the numbers that we have here. But China lost 860 million people, uh, you know, and that its, its demography is going down. I believe in the next uh, five, ten years, two th one third of their population will be above 60. The economy is down to 1.3 to 3 percent. So, you know, you were saying that there's, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, that there's been a 30 percent salary cut of, of the party. So, uh, th there's a lot Bonuses of... Bonuses are being withdrawn. Sorry? Bonuses are being withdrawn. Bonuses have been withdrawn. That were given have been withdrawn. 
And you made a very interesting point, which is that you said if America sanctions China and stops Chinese students from going abroad, that might be the trigger for uh, Chinese part, uh, the Communist Party to revolt because all their children are studying abroad. Uh, is, is that intelligence or is that just uh, well, so Well, it's 80% uh, of the director level people of the Chinese Communist Party have their children studying in either the US, UK, Australia or Canada. So that's a large number. And that translates, if you do the math, to 300 million people either belonging to the Chinese Communist Party, present, retired, or dependent directly. Now, if those people are unhappy, they're going to turn the uh, pressure on to Xi Jinping. Right. Uh, because they'll say that our relationship with America, which is a very treasured relationship for the Chinese, has been ruined, and you've done it. And uh, you better step down, because the party is now in trouble. Right. I'm so sorry, we are really going to run out of time and I'm, I'm afraid you might all suddenly want dinner and bed. So I'm just going to call out a couple of questions. Is, and none of your names are here, so I'm not being able to call that out. Uh, there's a question that, is bio war real? And if yes, is the threat to the world only from China or elsewhere? Is India vigilant enough? Will China invade Taiwan and establish its hegemony? Uh, there are questions about is Chinese hand in the ongoing Adani saga? Uh, <laughs> that's one you should take. Do we have a foreign hand going on in China? Well, we can always try. <laughs> okay. Um, and then there are more questions about... Um, sorry. Yeah, this is a good question to Brahma. What is the proportion of our current trade surplus imports from China that are non-essential uh, in your view. And there are more questions about dethroning within. So I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave it at that. Will you take the bio-warfare question and will you take the question on what is the component of essential goods that India has? So, want to go first? The Chinese are working on bio-warfare. In fact, they've stepped up their research, uh, military-related research on bio-warfare. They're also working on new uh, technologies in uh, biological warfare where they can target certain um, races. So they're working on, uh, shall I, how do they say, manipulating the virus to attack certain ethnic uh, groups. Um, I don't know how far they progressed, I don't know where they are, but they are working on it and that we know. So right. it's something we've got to be careful about. Right. Well, the, according to one study, about 45% of India's imports from China are non-essential, but it you know, really centers on how you define non-essential or essential items. On Taiwan, the Chinese aggression will not be a full-fledged aggression. Biden was asked last September, will the US defend Taiwan if the, China, if the Chinese were to attack? He said, yes, if there were, if there was an unprecedented attack, but there won't be an unprecedented attack. What China will do is to launch a slow squeeze of Taiwan. Chinese approach is incremental, step by step. At what point will the US respond to a slow squeeze of Taiwan? We saw last August when the Chinese conducted the, their exercises around Taiwan, how they're going to throttle Taiwan. They're going to blockade Taiwan, both by both air blockade and a sea blockade. So at what point will the Americans feel they, they have to intervene to defend Taiwan will be the critical issue that will decide Taiwan's faith. On the issue of demographics, it's very important. Why is Xi Jinping in a hurry to achieve what he calls the Chinese dream? The Chinese dream being China emerging as the world's number one power, supplanting the United States. Believing that China has a narrow window of strategic opportunity before China confronts a demographic crisis, stalled economic growth, an unfavorable international climate, Xi Jinping has been increasingly taking risks. The fact is that China is already facing long-term structural constraints to emerging as a preeminent power. Just take one issue. 
its demographic crisis. Last year, deaths outnumber births in China, which shows that not only is China's population shrinking, it's rapidly aging. Today, India, India's, India's average age is 28.4, making India one of the world's youngest countries. In 2050, India's mean average, a, mean age will be, will be 36 only. But what will be China's? 53, 53. It'll be a very aging society. In other words, demographics alone show that China cannot remain the world's factory flow. That's the reason why India has to seize the opportunity to emerge as a manufacturing powerhouse. Only then can India emerge as a world power. It's very important for India to go from services-led economic growth to becoming a manufacturing powerhouse that utilizes the current opportunities to make that transformation. Right. Can I just make one comment on demography? Yes. The Chinese are trying very hard to uh, try and get people to get married, to produce children. But I think Chinese mothers are very concerned. Kids are not getting married. <laughs> right. So, talking about Ekta's serials that celebrate the institution of marriage on demography, on digitization, particularly on democracy. India has a march over China. Uh, over dinner, you know, we didn't get to touch all this, but Mr. Ranade was saying, at least in the realm of conventional war, we are in a good state, and China feels that we have enough deterrence. But there are many, many other aspects of this. I'm just going to leave it for after, you know, when we are having a drink after our sessions. Both of them are available, and you'll be able to speak about it. One thing which intrigues me is that at a time when we're talking about decoupling with China, we've had, uh, you know, G German premier, we've had the French premier, all of them making a beeline to China. China's trying to replace the dollar. And as I said at the beginning of the session, two-thirds of the world trades more with China than with America. So there are lots of things to disentangle there, and I hope these are just the seeds of thought that we can continue a discussion on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chalani. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rana. It's been wonderful. <laughs>